Thanks, everybody, for coming, uh, and welcome. Uh, this is the first lecture in a series of four for the This Falls Frankie Seminar on the Humanities. As Gary just mentioned, the Frankie Seminars and Lectures uh, uh, in the Humanities are intended to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience, uh, that's you, uh, and to tie interdisciplinary undergraduate education to the work of distinguished visiting scholars like Professor Mickix here. So all of this, yes, is made possible by the generosity of Richard and Barbara Fain. Thank you again, thank you personally. Uh, uh, the topic of this year's seminar uh, are the uh, affinities, echoes, consonances, dissonances, transpositions, anticipatory plagiarisms, inverse influences, and other modes of relation between thought and writing of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Friedrich Nietzsche. And we are very honored and very happy to have uh, David Mickix here with us today to speak on this topic. Uh, Professor Mickix, who took his PhD here at Yale in English, is John and Rebecca Moore's distinguished professor in the English department at the University of Houston. He has written uh, widely uh, uh, and on essays on subjects ranging from Shakespeare to Freud to movies to contemporary fiction. Uh, his reviews and commentary appear regularly in Tablet. Uh, and he's on the Council of the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics, and Writers. His first book, uh, Ohio UP 2013, is indeed on Emerson and Nietzsche. It's called The Romance of Individualism in Emerson and Nietzsche, and it is a very engaging, and ambitious, and uh, vigorous and pungent book uh, on the problem or the task or the attempt uh, at individualism, that is the ongoing project, in different ways, uh, both of uh, Emerson and Nietzsche. He is also the author of Who Was Jacques Derrida? Uh, an Intellectual Biography, which is a, a very well-turned and thoughtful, somewhat polemical, somehow also thorough intellectual biography of Derrida. Uh, and with Stephen Burke as his collaborator, The Art of the Sonnet, an anthology of a hundred English sonnets with uh, very uh, uh, illuminating and acute uh, commentary uh, following each of them, which also somehow manages to be thorough uh, in, the, in those countries. For the purposes of today and for this Frankie seminar and for this event, he is uh, perhaps, I want to say, most, uh, uh, most gloriously the editor of the Annotated Emerson, which is a really beautiful edition recently from Harvard UP, with David's, uh, in addition to the, uh, the major essays, uh, journal entries, addresses, uh, uh, poetry, all with David's um, uh, learned and acute and well-turned and yet uh, annotations with a kind of light touch. It's a very, very fine book and if anyone here is interested in Emerson and working on Emerson or just enjoying Emerson, uh, I highly, highly recommend you get a copy of the annotated Emerson as uh, edited by uh, Professor Mickix. Uh, he is most recently the author of a book called Slow Reading uh, in a Hurried Age, which is also uh, from Harvard. And from what I can tell, although I haven't yet had a chance to read it, but the book, as we've just been saying, is in part on uh, the nature of attention and attentiveness and how uh, attention is changing uh, and how reading and slow reading might be a mode of attention that we should strive to cultivate or uh, be serious about. Today, uh, though, Professor Mickix will be talking about Emerson, Nietzsche, and the Romantic world. Please join me in welcoming David Mickix. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks for that general, generous and general introduction, Paul. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, both Pauls, Paul Grimstad and Paul North, for inviting me. And uh, of course, the Whitney Humanities Center and uh, especially the Frankie family. I was actually, in the 1980s, when I was here as a graduate student, I was a Frankie fellow. And though I had not <laughs> encountered them before, um, I'm once again you know, very grateful for, uh, for their support. Um, so, so particularly pleasing to come back under the aegis of this uh, lecture. Um, can everyone hear me? Is this, uh, you know, I was sitting over there, so there's some street noise. There is, uh, I sent around a handout, and uh, unfortunately there aren't enough copies, I think, but I'll do my best to um, make the lecture as clear as possible without, you know, for those who can't look at the handout. So um, I, I hope it will make sense even if you don't have the handout, but if you do, I'll tell you what to look at 
when. OK, the theme of this talk, uh, it, I'm going to start from the old opposition between Enlightenment and Romanticism. And I'm going to argue that this, uh, this old opposition is actually profoundly useful now and that Emerson and Nietzsche together help us understand the opposition between Enlightenment and Romanticism. I'll be, as I'll be reading the two terms, and it's, um, I'm reading them in a slightly unusual way perhaps, so I'll explain how. As I'm, as I'm reading the two terms, Enlightenment and Romanticism, with the help of Isaiah Berlin, um, uh, in the passages I'm going to quote to you in a moment, um, Emerson, uh, in these terms, is mostly an Enlightenment thinker, rather surprisingly, perhaps. And Nietzsche is mostly a Romantic thinker. But Emerson has his Romantic moments, and we'll focus on one of those moments today from his great essay, Fate. Historically, of course, Enlightenment precedes Romanticism, but it also follows Romanticism. It tries for a way out of or an escape from Romanticism's more dangerous aspects. After Romanticism, Enlightenment tries to get Romanticism under control, if not to tame it, then at least to encompass it. In this talk, I'm not asking us to choose between Enlightenment and Romanticism. In a sense, we can't choose. But I am urging us to recognize that if Romanticism sees a truth that Enlightenment ignores, as I think it does, then that Romantic truth is more risky, more corrosive of Enlightenment goals than we usually think it is. So there's something dangerous in Romanticism, something permanently dangerous, something that needs to be taken account of, and something that's not necessarily uh, reconcilable with the Enlightenment in the way that we think that it is, I, I believe, most of the time. Most of the time we pretend that Enlightenment and Romanticism can be reconciled, which means really that the Enlightenment can subsume Romanticism, or that Romanticism can become enlightened. But I argue that it can't. The two things, Enlightenment and Romanticism, confront each other, both then and now. Uh, well, first, I, I, I want to uh, propose the idea that we live now in an age of Enlightenment. That is, we live in a time in which most of us, most of the time, have signed on to the Enlightenment ideals. For example, we like to think that the world, both the human world and the natural world, has a structure that's being discovered or could be discovered that all disruptive impulses serve their function or have their place. If we look at them scientifically, we talk increasingly about aggression and passion as biological levers, as part of a biological or evolutionary system. And we think that there can be shared, agreed upon goals for the purpose of maximizing human happiness or human flourishing. This also entails, of course, that we think we have a good idea of what human happiness is, that happiness is the same thing for everyone, even if people don't know it yet. People may think that it makes them happy to take violent revenge, for example, but they're wrong. Pop psychology and pop science are telling in this regard. We might, to the, we, we might condescend to pop psychology or pop science, but I think they are representative of what we believe. We are creatures of enlightenment. Uh, that doesn't mean that I think the way they say it is the right way, but uh, we'll, uh, you'll, you'll see the plot will go on here. The ambition that drives enlightenment, our ambition, goes back to Plato. For Plato, the more we pursue knowledge, the more we realize that the tyrant isn't really happy. True happiness means having self-knowledge, having control of one's impulses, and so on. The Enlightenment Project also goes back to the classic 18th century thinkers like Hume. For Hume, people may strive to get to happiness in strikingly different ways, but happiness itself, for Hume, is a predictable thing. No one wants to be discontent or miserable. If they do want to be discontent or miserable, their aim is defective. They could and should live their lives much better. The current ascendancy of neuroscience is, is just the latest form of the, the Enlightenment's insistence that human happiness can and ought to be defined. We're hardwired for happiness, proclaims the cover of Time magazine. This was a lot a line that was quoted by Adam Gopnik in a recent New Yorker piece, we're hardwired for happiness. And the idea that happiness can be located in the same part of everyone's brain stands for the idea that happiness can be metaphysically located in a similar way, that we can know what it really is, that we can agree on it, pure enlightenment doctrine. Nietzsche the Romantic, by contrast, not only shatters the notion that happiness can be defined, but he doesn't even like the idea that we pursue happiness at all. 
He says in the, Nietzsche says in The Will to Power, one does not desire happiness. One must be English to believe that man always seeks his advantage. And he's referring, of course, to English philosophy, to, to Hume or to, uh, to Mill, you know, for whom uh, one seeks uh, one's advantage, one seeks security or happiness. Nietzsche doesn't believe this. But we believe it, I think. So this is what we don't think. We don't think that it's somehow noble to be passionate and intense no matter what the object of your passion is, even if your passion dooms you, whereas the romantics do or did often value passion in this way. Look at what Nietzsche says in The Gay Science, <coughs> uh, number 99, paragraph 99 in The Gay Science, what Nietzsche ascribes to Wagner's heroes, especially Siegfried, he says, uh, this is actually not on your handout, but uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Nietzsche says in another passage of the gay science, uh, speaking of Wagner's heroes, the innocence of the utmost selfishness, the faith in great passion as the good in itself. The innocence of the utmost selfishness, the faith in great passion as the good in itself. Is this appealing to us? No. We don't believe in radical asceticism or crazy risk taking for their own sake as if those things could bring out some kind of glory. Every star in heaven is discontented and insatiable, wrote Emerson that time in a romantic mood. And Nietzsche wrote, you must have chaos within yourself to give birth to a dancing star. We don't buy it. We associate ruthless drive, extreme passion, and insatiability with the 20th century, the most destructive ever seen. We're convinced that if Emerson and Nietzsche had seen the 20th century, then they wouldn't have, they, they wouldn't have praised uncompromising passions the way they did. Sometimes gunpowder smells good, Emerson wrote in his journal on the eve of the Civil War. Gunpowder doesn't smell good to us anymore. But we need to challenge our enlightened prejudices. We need to let romanticism have its say. We tend to think of enlightenment as an answer to romanticism, a way of showing that life is not really as enigmatic, uncontrollable, or reckless as romanticism makes it out to be. But we can also reverse the question. Does romanticism know something that enlightenment doesn't want to know? So at this point, I want to go on to Isaiah Berlin for uh, his original definition of these two contrasting terms, which may surprise you. I know they surprised me. This is from Berlin's bro book called The Roots of Romanticism. It's a, a lecture series that he gave in 1965, the Mellon Lectures given in Washington, DC. And um, they were only published over 30 years later at the instigation of his uh, um, his editor, uh, Henry Hardy, and his student, Henry Hardy. Um, so this is, actually, I want to start with the second. If you have the handout, it's the second, uh, the second passage on your handout, the one beginning, like Hegel. In, in, this second pa in this passage, Berlin is talking about enlightenment. You might, think, you might think of Hegel or Goethe as romantic spirits, but Berlin is arguing that, no, they are not romantic. Actually, they have, they're more akin to the Enlightenment. They're actually Enlightenment rather than Romantic. Like Hegel, Goethe supposed that the divine harmonies could be made only by sharp clashes, by violent disharmonies, which from a greater height would have been perceived as contributi contributory factors to some enormous harmony. But that is not Romantic. If anything, it is anti-Romantic because the general tendency of Goethe is to say there is a solution, a hard, difficult solution, perhaps to be perceived only by the mystical eye, but nevertheless a solution. So um, it's important to know here that uh, uh, I'm going to get to the Berlin passage about romanticism in one moment, but it's important to know that he's shifting the meaning of these two terms uh, for, um, uh, for Berlin's uh, a wide-eyed mystic like Emerson's friend Bronson Alcott, that transcendentalist New Ager, would be on the side of enlightenment, not romanticism, and so would Emerson for the most part, although uh, Berlin doesn't mention Emerson in his, uh, in his book. Anyone who thinks that we can draw on or orchestrate or make sense of our violent conflicts and our passionate impulses, that we can manage these things in a way that will add up to, in, Berli in Berlin's words, an enormous harmony, a divine harmony, that person, like Emerson, is a believer in enlightenment. Contrast romanticism, which is the, the, uh, the top of the page, the first passage on the handout. Once you get the notion, it begins. 
It's quite a cadenza here that Berlin gives us on the subject of romanticism. Once you get the notion that there is outside us something larger, something unseizable, something unobtainable, you either have feelings towards it of love, as Fichte wanted, or of fear. And if you have feelings of fear, the fear becomes paranoiac. This paranoia goes on accumulating in the 19th century. It accumulates to a height in Schopenhauer. It dominates the works of Wagner, and it comes to an immense climax in all kinds of works in the 20th century, obsessed by the thought that no matter what we do, there is some canker, some worm in the bud somewhere. There is something which dooms us to perpetual frustration, whether it be human beings whom we must exterminate or impersonal forces against which all effort is useless. Uh, Berlin says elsewhere in the book, speaking of the Romantics, that they tend to oscillate between extremes of mystical optimism and appalling pessimism. There's a fundamental instability in Romanticism in his picture of it that cannot be remedied. Something called human nature or something, human nature or something called the dark forces rise up and strike you in the face should you attempt to argue against them, should you attempt to alter them. Um, but also, um, also central to Romanticism, as Berlin uh, depicts it, is the creation of new values and the idea that value creation is what we do. We each, uh, we each uh, construct a picture of the universe. And as Berlin puts it, my final quotation from him, it's not on the, uh, not on the handout. Uh, elsewhere in the book, Berlin says, the universe of people possessed by one set of illusions or fantasies will be different from the universe of those possessed by another. And again, you might be trapped by your vision of the universe. This is the idea of the paranoiac world that he depicts. So for Berlin, on the one hand, romanticism is about creating values. The universe is yours, you made it. To use an Emersonian image, you can eat it like a cake. On the other hand, for Berlin, romanticism is about things tipping over into darkness, paranoia. And the reason for the paranoia is that, as in the passage I quoted, there's always a worm in the bud, some frustration that can't be overcome. Something is capable of ruining, ruining the romantic hope and the visionary op optimism. In, in uh, another passage in The Gay Science, uh, Nietzsche recalls an ancient tradition that some fishermen posed a riddle to Homer. Homer he depicts as a you know, sort of great, overflowing, noble spirit. But uh, Homer could not solve this little riddle and that was enough to spoil life for him. It was enough to, you know, that exposed the flaw in everything. So this is that worm in the bud, that, uh, that fault that frustrates. So um, first of all, I, I want to do this in two sections, first about Emerson and then about Nietzsche. And as I said, the Emerson I'm going to talk about, I think, is uh, one of the most romantic uh, moments in Emerson, even though I, I think of him, uh, as I'm telling you, as, a, as an enlightenment figure, a figure who thinks that he can harmonize the disruptive passions or put them to work or see their place in the larger scheme of things. Um, but there are also moments in Emerson, like the one I'm going to be talking about, where things are much more out of kilter, where it seems that um, uh, the darkness or the passion takes over. Um, <coughs> The law of compensation declares Emerson's enlightenment side. He has an essay, of course, on compensation. It implies that what goes around, however harshly, then comes around smoothly. But he's not always an enlightenment thinker in this way. He doesn't always think it's possible to corral romantic impulses within an enlightened and finally harmonious structure. The essay Fate is a case in point. Fate is the opening essay in The Conduct of Life, published in 1860. In fate, harmony and enlightenment evade Emerson. Fate as a principle is different from compensation. It's more unstable. It lends itself to romanticism rather than enlightenment. Emerson does hope for a harmony, for a synthesis, even here in fate. And it's stated here by Emerson as a, as a hope, not a fact. Um, uh, this is, again, is not on your handout. It's near the beginning of the essay. He says, by obeying each thought frankly, by harping, or if you will, pounding on each string, we learn at last its power. By the same obedience to other thoughts, we learn theirs, and then comes some reasonable hope of harmonizing them. What he wants to harmonize is the idea, on the one hand, of fate, of merciless destiny, that which constrains us or even crushes us, and then on the other hand, the idea of freedom, the freedom that we feel within us. Um, 
Then comes some reasonable hope of harmonizing them. The phrase, some reasonable hope, I think sounds tentative, and I believe it's meant to sound tentative. What we're supposed to harmonize is, again, the iron law of fate that bears down on us, the jaws that snatch, and on the other hand, the freedom that we feel is ours. But Emerson's fate feels like it's more on the side of the snatching jaws than on the side of freedom. He says, the way of providence is a little rude, the habit of snake and spider, the snap of the tiger and other leapers and bloody jumpers, the crackle of the bones of his prey in the coil of the anaconda. These are in the system and our habits are like theirs. You have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in the graceful distance of miles, there is complicity, expensive races, race living at the expense of race. Where is the characteristic, where is the characteristic Emersonian thrust in, trust in freedom here? This is not very harmonious, not very free. Expensive races, race living at the expense of race. In another later passage in Fate, Emerson depicts life as a clash, a stupendous antagonism of perspectives. And this is on the handout, the third passage, if you have it. <coughs> I'm just going to refer to this briefly uh, and uh, abbreviate my discussion a little bit. Um, and uh, the, the passage that begins, man is not order of nature, sack and sack, belly and members, but, is a great phrase, a stupendous antagonism, a dragging together of the poles of the universe. On the one hand, man is what he calls the lightning which explodes and fashions planets, makers of plan maker of planets and sun. Um, uh, on the other hand, elemental order, right, this sort of base or animal side. And then he concludes this passage by saying, here they are side by side, God and devil, mind and matter, king and conspirator, belt and spasm, riding together peacefully in the eye and brain of every man. Um, the lightning that Emerson mentions is hardly a predictable or controllable force. It's a daimon, a god in the shape of a devil. Thought decomposes as well as composing as if oscillating between a daimonic motive and a finely structuring motive. In Emerson's line, side by side does not lead to a dialogue or a harmonizing of these two opposed drives. At most, you can shift from one to the other. The daimonic is uh, that thing that flashes within us, that illuminates us, um, or that gives us the godlike, but by definition, something unpredictable, something that um, cannot be made sense of, something that cannot be tied together to, uh, its, uh, to what surrounds it. Um, so there is still the, there is always the ambition for a solution or for a harmony here as elsewhere in Emerson, but I think this is bluntly denied by the tremendous ending of the essay, which I want to, um, which I want to look at now. And uh, on the handout, this is the next two passages both of which begin with, let us build altars to the beautiful necessity. Um, and this, I think, is, is very peculiar. I'm going to read this great sort of aria that he gives to destruction, uh, at least the, few, the last few lines of it. Um, the, this would be the fifth, the fifth paragraph on your handout. Why should we fear to be crushed by savage elements? we who are made up of the same elements. Let us build to the beautiful necessity, which makes man brave in believing that he cannot shun a danger that is appointed, nor incur one that is not, to the necessity which rudely or softly educates him to the perception that there are no contingencies, that law rules throughout existence, a law which is not intelligent but intelligence, not personal nor impersonal, it disdains words and passes understanding. It dissolves persons. It vivifies nature, yet solicits the pure in heart to draw on all its omnipotence. At the end of the essay, Fate, Emerson is stressed to the breaking point, actually beyond the breaking point, by the opposition between, on the one hand, a sublime and terribly grim universe, like the one God reveals to Job at the end of the book of Job, and on the other hand, the sweet strength that draws on pureness of heart. 
Necessity rudely or softly educates a person, Emerson says, but this final vision seems not an education, but rather a commanding threat, like the vision that God gives to Job. We are supposed to build altars to the beautiful necessity, altars on which we ourselves will be sacrificed. Why should we fear to be crushed by savage elements, we who are made up of the same elements? This is the most horrifying question in all of Emerson's writings because here he refuses to wish or to pretend or to hope that the savagery is really something more sophisticated or more acceptable. Being crushed is still and always a savage process. He admits it. It sounds like a line in Kafka. Emerson knows that what he is saying is, unlike the speeches that our religions give to their martyrs, utterly incapable of reconciling anyone to his or her death at the hands of fate. That is still a nightmarish event. And the last phrase of the essay, with its allusion to, uh, to the Gospel of Matthew, to the Sermon on the Mount, seems to me to be a self-contradictory footnote, no more and no less, and Emerson knows it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. In that passage from the Gospels, Jesus' line about the pure in heart occurs in the midst of a series of blessings, blessings of those who suffered, blessings of those who suffer, those who are persecuted, Mourners will be comforted, the persecuted will be rewarded in heaven, Jesus assures us. But in Emerson, by contrast, the persecuted are supposed to draw on the energy, he calls it the light, of the, per of the persecution itself, which is omnipotent. There's no escape. So he still sounds like Kafka in these final words. He, re he redefines suffering as hope rather than hinting in Jesus' way at a salvation from or even a salve for suffering. <clears throat> Again, fate differs from most of Emerson. In contrast to what he says in fate, Emerson often in other essays insists that the streaks of darkness, meaning both human evil and the apparent disasters of fate, that these darknesses actually lend themselves to a greater unified light, to a harmony that is basically, even if mysteriously, good. Which is to say, in Berlin's terms, that like Goethe, Emerson usually isn't a full-fledged romantic, but rather a man of the Enlightenment. He looks for a way to encompass even the worst aspects of existence within a relatively placid and synoptic law, the greater harmony. Emerson includes the romantic desires in a larger pattern that is meant to make these desires less dangerous, less capable of ruining the crucial idea, the idea that we must all hang on to, the idea that the universe finally proves itself a beautifully working whole. But in fate, Emerson, I think, is romantic in Berlin's sense of the word. He is split between God and devil, and the split testifies to Emerson's romanticism. And he even makes the divine look devilish. Um, I don't think this reading of fate is overly subtle. I mean, I was thinking as I was writing this about the difference between the way in which Emerson turns back on himself and the way in which Nietzsche turns back on himself. And um, you know, Nietzsche lets you know that he's turning back on himself. And in Emerson, it often seems to slide by us. Um, but Emerson does also turn back on himself. And I think he does so here. That is, um, that line about the pure in heart at the very end of fate is something that is meant to, uh, you know, to stick in our craw. It is something that alerts us to an irreconcilability in what he's saying. OK, so uh, on to Nietzsche. And I want to go back to the theme of paranoia mentioned in Berlin's passage. There is a paranoid side to Nietzsche. He fights hard against the paranoia, but it's there. He sees humans as self-thwarting, self-frustrating creatures. And this is where he ends, alas, in Ecce Homo, a very paranoid text in which Nietzsche is darkly obsessed by the flaws in existence. One of those flaws is the maternal influence on him, his mother. Um, but. Um, here you see, in Ecce Homo, his last book, you see Nietzsche trapped by, um, by this, uh, you know, these dark forces. But also, um, Nietzsche describes the ascetics universe uh, in uh, the Genealogy of Morals, uh, the, uh, the final essay of the Genealogy of Morals about asceticism. That is a paranoid universe. Nietzsche speaks of man as the sick animal in the Genealogy of Morals. The, satisfied and the unsatisfied and insatiable, who finds no more rest from the pressure of his own strength, so that his future mercilessly digs into the flesh of every present like a spur. This nausea, this weariness, this fatigue, this disgust with himself. 
And, but then he tries to turn this, right? He says, but his no, that is man's no, that he says to himself, brings to light a wealth of more tender yeses, as if by magic. What is the magic that makes these tender yeses appear, that pulls the Nietzschean yes out of, out of the ascetic no? The ascetic, again, is consumed by weariness, fatigue, nausea, frustration, self-forwarding. What makes the yes appear is the ability, Nietzsche's ability, to think of the ascetic's weariness and perpetual discontent as strategies that make us interesting to ourselves. The canker or the worm in the bud that Berlin mentions in existence is what makes us interesting. That seemingly ruinous flaw is in fact a source of intrigue. We can investigate it, Nietzsche says, rather than becoming damaging, damagingly obsessed with it. It's necessary to step back to see things this way, to see things as a comedy, a gay science, rather than as a tragedy. The tormented quester or saint or artistic martyr becomes the far cooler scientist. Nietzsche looks on from a distance, from the distance of the gods, at the ways we torment ourselves. So let's see, and this is a long passage, it's actually an even longer one, I've abbreviated, I've abbreviated it, the first paragraph or the first uh, section of the gay science um, that's at the bottom of your first page here, whether I contemplate men with benevolence or with an evil eye. It has the heading, uh, which I've left out, but the heading is the teachers of the purpose of existence. The implication being Nietzsche himself is one of these teachers too. Um, <coughs> so in this passage, Nietzsche divides, uh, he has two things to consider. And first, it's the fact that the most harmful people in human history, or the most seemingly harmful people in human history, you know, the great destroyers, the great predators, they in fact are probably the most useful ones. As he says, um, you know, we tend to divide our neighbors quickly into useful and harmful, good and evil men. But when we reflect on the whole a little longer, we become suspicious of this neat division finally and finally abandon it. Even the most harmful man may really be the most useful when it comes to the preservation of the species. That's near the bottom of this uh, first page of the handout. For he nurtures either in himself or in others through his effects instincts without which humanity would long have become feeble or rotten. Instincts like hatred, schadenfreude, lust to, to rob and dominate. These things are either the province of outright thugs and tyrants, these are these sort of barbaric useful ones, or else of the sophisticated useful ones, the super, the super subtle religious types, like St. Paul, who plays a major role in uh, Nietzsche's previous book, Daybreak. Um, St. Paul, who uh, 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 convinces himself and tries to convince us that, um, that human life is something self-tormenting, miserable, um, and, uh, and, and bloody, a kind of crucifixion. Um, but Nietzsche likes this. He likes the, um, the religious teachers as well. Uh, so we go on to the second half of, uh, of his discussion here. If you turn over the page, it's, uh, there are two sides to the handout. So if you have the handout, you can look uh, at the rest of this first paragraph of the gay science. They too, um, the teachers of remorse and religious wars, they too promote the life of the species by promoting the faith in life. Life is worth living, every one of them shouts. There is something to life. There is something behind life, beneath it. Beware. From time to time, this instinct, which is at work equally in the highest and the basest men, the instinct for the preservation of the species erupts as reason and as passion of the spirit. Life shall, I'm skipping a bit, life shall be loved because man shall advance himself and his neighbor because what names all these shalls and becauses receive and may yet receive in the future. Just like the murderous barbarians, the teachers of the meaning of existence might seem to have harmed humanity. Instead of enjoying life, we now think of it as something corrupt, burdened by original sin, and so on. But there's an analogy. Just as the worst of predators could really only have harmed humanity, only if they had actually destroyed us could they have harmed humanity, in toto destroyed us, so the philosophers and teachers of religious asceticism could have harmed us only if their ethical systems had actually gained power over humanity. And this, I think, is one of the most peculiar parts of this paragraph. 
because normally when Nietzsche talks about revolutions in morals, um, the birth of asceticism and so on, he, th he thinks of it as something that has taken over, that has in fact taken over and changed things. But here in, um, in this paragraph from The Gay Science, he does something quite different. If you look down near, to near the end of that first, uh, near the end of that paragraph, um, and all ethical systems hitherto have been so foolish and anti-natural that humanity would have perished of every one of them if it had gained power over humanity. It didn't gain power over humanity. Uh, so I think that um, you know, here Nietzsche is saying something very different from what he usually says. Uh, instead of Paul or instead of the Buddha, um, instead of, uh, uh, of modern science uh, having a, you know, taking over the minds of humanity. And these teachers of the meaning of existence did not take over. But what they did was they made us more interesting to ourselves by giving us a kind of option. The teachers told us there's a secret purpose to existence, a reason that makes life worth living. And therefore, they did us even more service than the barbarians did. The barbarians toughened us up. The religious teachers, they turned us into a case, a mystery. They gave us meaning. And um, they, however, their, uh, the, uh, their, their bestowal of meaning on us is kept within bounds by Nietzsche. They're not allowed to conquer humanity. If they were to conquer humanity, they would deform us or perhaps even destroy us. Um, so here Nietzsche suggests one benefit of stepping back, of looking from a distance. The theories about the meaning of existence no longer dominate and victimize us. Instead, they invite us to a glimpse of our interesting individuality. And stepping back, of course, also means seeing more completely, Nietzsche says, as opposed to the ascetic's narrow or obsessed eye. We feel compelled to create beliefs and be causes, Nietzsche says. Nietzsche here hints at his own preaching. Will he, the prophet of the future, the man who tells humanity what it needs and what it ought to be, will he be the one to give us the new shalls and the new becauses? Will his shalls and his becauses also be merely passions, instincts, and drives in disguise? Which is what he said about the previous ethical teachers. Uh, it is really instinct, drive, folly, lack of reason that they give us in the guise of reason. Will Nietzsche's shalls and becauses be partial, out of kilter, romantic in their over-insistence and their intense obsessive focus on some worm in the bud, some fatal flaw in us? That is, will Nietzsche's proposed values be no more fully created, no more answerable to the whole of existence, and therefore no more justified than those of the Christians or the Buddhists, of Kant or of Schopenhauer? If the, if the answer is no, that he's really like them, if Nietzsche gives us simply a new version of the old prophetic bossiness exhibited by all those earlier teachers of the meaning of existence, then he is no more to be trusted than they are. And that's why Nietzsche has to go beyond the argument he gives us in Gay Science Number 1. And he does so in a number of places in his work where he makes the case for his own superiority over these earlier teachers. How is he better than Paul or the Buddha or Plato or Kant or Schopenhauer? He's better only if he is more responsible to the whole of human life than the old teachers were. They, the old teachers, wanted to pluck out an eye or a limb because it offended them. Whereas Nietzsche, he says, plucks nothing out. He acknowledges more about life, he acknowledges more of life, more about life than has ever been acknowledged before. So this looks like an enlightened claim that you can have a true picture of the character of existence and that this picture dictates certain values that recognize life because they respond to the whole of life. And this Nietzsche opposes to the self-punishing and partial values that denied existence or significant parts of existence up until now. Yet, there's a twist. And here Nietzsche's argument turns over, it experiences its phase of doubt. What if the true picture of existence is that it, existence, is exploitative, unbalanced, self-deluding, and self-deluded, if it's a cruelty that likes to disguise itself? What new values would serve that picture of things except values that are deluded about themselves, and therefore particularly untrustworthy? What if life is blindness and error? Nietzsche asks this in, uh, be, uh, in Beyond Good and Evil. What then becomes of our search for truth? And he has no answer to this. Now we've tipped over into the romantic world, the unstable world. We see how the optimistic dream of creating new values can instead become loyalty to a nightmare universe, an unjust or unbalanced universe, and therefore an accentuation of what traps us rather than a liberation. 
This is the dark side of the romantic view that cannot be separated from the light or the liberating side because they're bound together in an unstable way. Emerson in Fate gives us some optimistic moments overshadowed by a much more memorable picture of destruction. Emerson still wants the harmony of fate and freedom, but he knows he can't have it. And now his sublime creative energy is going over to the dark side because, as in the book of Job, the dark side is where the action is, where the imagination governs. Nietzsche, in his work, is more ambitious. He wants to transform darkness into light, transform no into yes, so that the horrible or the dangerous things about existence can become the good things about existence. In this respect, Emerson is like the rebel who wants from time to time to topple the existing order. To use Emerson's own image, the child's hand pulling down the sun. Er, image from fate. Emerson says, there is fate, but there is also freedom. Nietzsche, though, is like the reformer who wants to change things not by tearing down what exists, but by basing his chosen or desired future as closely as possible on the way things are. We are ascetic animals, Nietzsche says self-punishing animals. Instead of revolting against this fact and trying to become something else, happily tamed and reconciled, instead, let's transfigure the meaning of asceticism so that instead of denying life, asceticism becomes a savoring of life. And Nietzsche says, maybe that's already the case. Maybe asceticism is ready to savor life. So it's a reform, not a revolution. But Nietzsche then has to reckon, another twist, Nietzsche then has to reckon with the fact that savoring life and denying it might be closer together than he expected. That being against life and serving life can't be held apart in any meaningful way. In uh, uh, paragraph number one of The Gay Science, which uh, I, I showed to you, Nietzsche said that seemingly being, seemingly being against life, like the old criminals and the old preachers, is really serving life. But if everything serves life, then life stops being something that leads us in a certain direction and instead becomes just a name for what happens. What's the meaning of endorsing life then, except to say that it's better to endorse what, we'll al what we're always and all of us subjected to. It's better to take control, better to use our will, instead of gloomily resigning ourselves to it. Why is it better to embrace life in this way? Because then we partake in the dance. We give ourselves over to the illusion. We are on the side of life. But this can come to seem like sheer madness, which is not what Nietzsche wanted, if he wanted reformism. Not at all a transformation of the way things are into the way they should be, but something else. Giving, giving yourself over to the dance, the reckless way of things, the work of the veil, the work of illusion, this can be bliss, but it can be nightmare as well, because it lets go of the hope for new shalls and new becauses. It means abandoning the creative will to compose a new self or a new order. Being the plaything of the universe rather than the creator of new values, this is Nietzsche's particular twist on the romantic paranoia that Berlin describes. So, Nietzsche then concludes, if life is error and blindness, it somehow has to undelude itself for the sake of sheer survival. It has to insist on the steady and knowable and unchanging realm of values, common values. And this is where we get to one of Nietzsche's most surprising turns, and this is uh, the, the bottom of the handout, the second side, titled The Greatest Danger. Here Nietzsche says something drastically different about what preserves our species from what he said in, uh, in paragraph number one. Um, there, of course, he said that the dangerous types, both the criminals and the preachers, preserve our species. But here he says that, no, it is the old, boring morality that preserves our species. For once, he seems to appro approve of the mundane or the boring. Knowing that he's a romantic, he's also aware of the dangers of romanticism. He realizes the possibility that the teachers of the meaning of existence might take over with their mad insistence on tormenting the intellect and the spirit, and then all of existence would become dark. Nietzsche announces here what it is that stops these teachers from taking over, what the break on romantic passion is and has to be. And you, again, you wouldn't have expected this from Nietzsche. It's a big surprise. Um, he says here, and I'll, I'll just read a few lines from this long passage, if the majority of men had not always considered the discipline of their minds, their rationality as their pride, their obligation, and their virtue, feeling insulted or embarrassed by all fantasies and debaucheries of thought or extravagances of thought, because they saw themselves as friends of healthy common sense, 
if not for all of this, if not for healthy common sense, then humanity would have per perished long ago. The greatest danger that always hovered over humanity and still hovers over it is the eruption of madness, which means the eruption of arbitrariness in feeling, seeing, and hearing, the enjoyment of the mind's lack of discipline, the joy in human unreason. And rather shockingly, he then goes on to, to link this danger, the joy in human unreason, to those who search for truth, like himself. Um, and he goes on to say that uh, you know, what we need to counter that search for truth is this great labor to reach agreement about very many things and to submit to a law of agreement, regardless of whether these things are true or false, the discipline of the mind. Um, continually, precisely, the most select spirits, like Nietzsche himself, bristle at this universal binding force, the explorers of truth above all. Continually, this faith, as, as everybody's faith, the common faith in the verities, arouses nausea and a new lust in subtler minds. And the slow tempo that is here demanded for all spiritual processes, this imitation of the tortoise, recognized as the norm, would be quite enough to turn artists and poets into apostates, these impatient spirits that have a veritable delight in madness, etc. So, um, and then he ends very powerfully by saying, um, it is a first-rate need that commands and demands this, that commands this great shared faith in, um, in the, the common truth, the common available truth, in enlightenment, really, as we've been speaking about it. Um, well, we others are the exception and the danger, and we need eternally to be defended. Well, there actually are things to be said in favor of the exception, provided that it never wants to become the rule. So here, this will be a major theme in Nietzsche's last years in the will to power fragments, his defense of the exception um, of those such as himself who think boldly and iconoclastically and disruptively about morals and about human life, but he defends those exceptions as exceptions rather than saying that they ought to take over. So you need a break on that sort of passion, on that sort of truth seeking, uh, that sort of uh, dangerous intellectual questing, and the break in this passage, B-R-A-K-E, the break is uh, the binding force of a faith um, in, in, uh, in common truths. So um, in, 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 uh, in uh, paragraph number one, as we saw, Nietzsche praised the secret gospel of the real meaning of existence, something we, we can't quite live by, but that bec beckons always, luring us beyond or behind our everyday lives. But in number 76, this paragraph, he praises instead the great shared faith, loyalty to good sense, to common rationality, the opposite of searching for truth, the opposite of what Nietzsche normally does. Um, this great labor, this great discipline, the most important achievement of humankind, the refusal to yield to the madness of the artists and the poets and the other daring types who try to create the meaning of existence in the romantic way, here Nietzsche warns against the romanticism that he usually endorses. He sees the search for truth, the meaning of existence, as an outburst of passion, of irrationality. In fact, he sees it as madness. This is what Nietzsche attributes to the explorers of truth, the ones who delight in subtlety and danger. It's a gay feeling they have, a comic feeling. This madness has a cheerful tempo. And here Nietzsche knows himself to be one of these upbeat, or actually manic, free dancing spirits. But he also recognizes what he didn't recognize in paragraph number one, that we can't trust the ones who trust to madness. That is, people like Nietzsche, who in The Birth of Tragedy, for example, praises the Dionysian, Dionysian madness as truer and more insightful than common reason. And this lack of trust shows itself in Nietzsche's new version of what preserves mankind, humankind. It's not the dangerous ones who are the species preservers, but rather the stolid ones, the ones bound in agreement to a common morality that is, bound to a different kind of dance, a slow and predictable one. There are things to be said in favor of the exception, but only if it remains an exception. The problem being, of course, that up to now the exceptions don't want to remain the exceptions, at least the exceptions that Nietzsche finds most fascinating don't want to remain the exceptions. I'm thinking of St. Paul in particular. Um, in, uh, in paragraph number 76, Nietzsche worries that the exceptions might take over, so he tells us about the thing that stands in their way, this uh, healthy common sense or healthy human understanding. 
So here we have Nietzsche, Nietzsche voicing the danger of romanticism. We need a dam or a bulwark. There's no way in which the drive to make life in, there's no way in which the drive to make life interesting could turn out well, he seems to be saying. There's no way in which it could lead to a harmonious or coherent universe of individuals in agreement with one another. There's no possibility of an enlightenment resolution here. Romantic truth seeking, the fervent pursuit of what really deserves to be valued, that will destroy us, that will destroy us if it's pursued on any large scale. And the quest, uh, the quest for what really deserves to be valued even resembles an endorsement of arbitrariness or sudden passion. And this, I think, for a clear reason. If the truth about us is, is that we're giddy, unreliable, risky, and potentially ruinous people, then pursuing the truth about us means courting ruin yourself. So Nietzsche here in, um, in number 76 says that control is not possible. When you think you have the truth, you want to force it on yourself and on others. When you create an interesting and insightful picture of existence, you stop attending to the risks that the picture poses to those who yield to it, uh, including to yourself. And that's why an external or artificial morality is needed as a break against such romantic revolution. The idea that such a break is needed, um, such an obstacle is needed so that we don't go mad, so that we aren't wrecked by vision is part of romanticism. Think of Wordsworth's resolution and independence, for example. Um, <coughs> I want to, um, so here, um, uh, to, to sum up what I'm saying here about number 76, the enlightenment version of the moral law that common sense propounds, the idea that the moral law is to everyone's advantage, including one's own, this clearly offends Nietzsche's artistic sensibility, but he holds on to it, at least he does so here. If morality is dumb, then we're dumb too, at least in part, and that's a necessary part of us, a kind of refuge. So now I'm, uh, my conclusion, uh, uh, I'm going to say a couple things about both Emerson and Nietzsche, and then mention one more passage from the gay science. For Nietzsche, things are more unknowable, more tricky than they are for Emerson, or at least what Nietzsche thinks he knows makes him very worried. What he thinks he knows is that life is one long dramatizing of exploitation, inequality, cruel, arbit ar cruel arbitrariness. Expensive races, race living at the expense of race, as Emerson puts it. Nietzsche does not, of course, produce a philosophy that simply endorses inequality, exploitation, and cruel arbitrariness. Instead, Nietzsche wants to refine our ways of exploiting and being cruel and hierarchical, to spiritualize us, or to sublimate those things. But if life is made of savage elements, to use Emerson's words, if life is first and last predatory, then Nietzsche still runs the risk of taking the side of savagery, even if it's a cunning or an artistic savagery. If the values Nietzsche wants are hard, cruel, and unfair, because that is what life wants, then how would this be a deliverance? or what would make this necessity a beautiful necessity, to use Emerson's phrase. Nietzsche pours scorn on the notion of creating new values that deny life, new values that would do away with hierarchy and exploitation, thus his uh, mocking of utopian socialism, uh, in which you know, we all suddenly become what in fact we must be, you know, what we can't possibly be. We can't possibly suddenly be con converted into, um, you know, into uh, creatures that, uh, uh, um, you know, lack all of the characteristics that for Nietzsche are the most interesting things about humans. Um, life doesn't work that way, Nietzsche says, but here is the problem. Going the way of life might mean yielding to the savage elements. So I want to conclude with one of the most provocative and strange paragraphs from the gay science. It's something that I haven't given to you on the handout. Uh, it's uh, paragraph number 26 and it's entitled, What is Life? And here Nietzsche describes life as, I'm quoting, being cruel and inexorable against everything about us that is growing old and weak. This is what life does, this is what we do. We are cruel and inexorable against everything about us that is growing old and weak. But as Nietzsche goes on, his adamant tone starts to doubt itself. His idea that life ruthlessly turns against everything old and weak comes up against an obstacle. What is life, Nietzsche asks here, and I'm quoting from him again. Being without reverence for those who are dying, for those who are wretched, who are ancient, constantly being a murderer, is that what life is? 
And then the final line of the paragraph in answer to these restless questions, Nietzsche says, and yet old Moses said, thou shalt not kill. And he leaves it there. To seek truth, to be one of the mad ones, the wrong ones, to be one of the Nietzsche's, is to murder the old and the weak. But is the old really the weak? The command of old Moses, thou shalt not kill, still lives. Nietzsche's own commandments are not yet born because he seems to be better at asking them than at answering. He seems to be better at, at asking than at answering. The revealed or the enlightened law, in this case the law of Moses, looks the same as it ever did. Even if it is false, it's agreed upon. But the romantic's quest, by contrast, is a tormented one. Constantly being a murderer? To what end and when will it stop? The enlightened sentence and the romantic questioning, not a dialogue, but a standoff. Thanks. Yes, yes. He, he made so many references to Nietzsche that the madness is sure enough to feed into I mean, Nietzsche doesn't exist. Well, yeah. What we hear about him. Yes, well, what you hear is true. Um, but. Um, but ironically, or ironically, I don't know yeah, what. Yeah, And, well, one of the difficulties is, um, but it's unavoidable. I mean, the, the evidence of Nietzsche's madness is already there in Ecce Homo, somewhat. So when we talk about madness and Nietzsche, we, uh, we have to take that into account, that that's meaningful to us, that's part of the record. Um, but, um, you know, once I was teaching Nietzsche and uh, one of my students, I was saying, I have to get to the bottom of this passage, let's try to figure this out. And one of my students raised her hand and said, um, do you think maybe that he was already mad when he wrote this? So I thought, no, 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 no. So, you know, we can't use madness as simply, uh, you know, a way of trying to avoid uh, something difficult that Nietzsche is trying to say. But um, there is an evidence of disintegration in his writing. I guess I would use that word in, in Ecce Homo in some late fragments. And so, you know, the, um, the, the, this sort of paranoid fear of the universe falling apart, um, it, it is something in Nietzsche, at least in these, in these last writings. But I think it's, I, I, you know, it's, 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 it's something that happens to his work as well as something that happens to him. Then I guess that's it. Well, I mean, in Nietzsche's term, you know, if Nietzsche has such a powerful impulse, which he does, to, to compose the self, to say that, um, you know, as I said before in the lecture, what he's trying to do is um, to say that he acknowledges more about life than anyone before did. He knows himself uh, particularly better than anyone else did. And so, you know, madness is the, uh, is the negation of all of that. To be mad is not to know yourself. It's to be out of control. It's to be taken over by forces. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Both Emerson and Nietzsche are massively involved in thinking what that might mean. Yeah, yeah. What would it mean to compose the self or, or uh, fashion the self? It's yeah. not something that's given. And so I want to start with that idea and go back through Berlin's, I would uh -huh. say, pretty idiosyncratic intellectual history mm -hmm. of getting from the Enlightenment to Romanticism and then, and then ask a question about personhood and the self that applies to Emerson and Nietzsche via Berlin. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. So Berlin. It's a kind of uh, uh, disembodied rationalist ethos. And when re re the revolt against enlightenment is precisely a revolt against the kind of horror at this artificiality, mm -hmm. at, at the, what seemed to be uh, a kind of smugness uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's at work in this way of thinking. And in the place of that, Berlin repeatedly calls it a glassy, a a, a overly symmetrical, Staking your life for what you believe in, mm -hmm. striving for something, mm. yearning for something, and it's completely personal. So, yes. so Haman, the other, I would include maybe Emerson and Nietzsche, although Berlin mm -hmm. doesn't mention it, it's personal. This is the nature of the rejection of the Enlightenment. So the way you think, the way you talk, the style, the whole approach mm -hmm. to doing philosophy even, mm -hmm. is ultimately just more idiosyncratic and more personal. But mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. They're differently personal. So yeah. to go to the problem of faith, it, the 
Emerson has other words besides faith mm -hmm. uh, that are linked directly to personhood, character. Mm -hmm. Your character is, is in some ways a, a matter of necessity in the way that mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. temperament is another word Emerson uses that's roughly synonymous here. Right. Even my nature and self-reliance, only what is, oh, I can only do what is in accordance with my nature. So even mm -hmm. naturalism has this determined. So even the project of self-fashion, the project mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. composing the self, Mm -hmm. Exactly this kind of, ro well, I want to say it is a way of harmonizing or mm -hmm. suturing the two halves. Mm -hmm. You've got the determinism, that's character, temperament, your mm -hmm. nature, mm -hmm. faith, and you've got the freedom. The freedom is shaping that or fashioning that or composing that into something that is totally personal. Nietzsche calls it amor fati, I think. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I would say, I don't know, might that be one way to understand? Uh -huh. you're, you're ending your talk on an irreconcilable, unsuturable mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, side by sideness. And I'm saying if you take the person as shot through with necessity in the way that Emerson does, isn't the project of self fashioning and self composing uh -huh. the way you get that harmony out of that? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I see what you're I see what you're saying. And I guess I mean you're you're asking a number of fascinating questions here. So just to backtrack a moment to the Berlin. Yeah, that's not an unfair characterization of Berlin, but he says, for example, that Rousseau points in two directions, enlightenment direction for the most part, but also romantic direction. Obvi perhaps the romantic direction is more obvious to us because you know, Rousseau is so interested in his own personality, his own peculiarities. He is who he is and no one else. But you know, by the same token, he says, no, you know, what Ru Rousseau really is is a man of the Enlightenment because he, he believes we all have these basic feelings of the heart and they're what tie us together and they're the same basic feelings in everyone. And so you know, just using that as a starting point, I, see, I think that uh, you know, we can make a difference between Emerson and, and Nietzsche by, by thinking about uh, the immensely different way in which they uh, approach the question of personality. You know, in Emerson, and, and I love Emerson, he's one of my guiding lights, but for Emerson, everyone winds up looking more or less the same. Um, in Nietzsche, people wind up looking rather different, I think. Um, so, in other words, uh, on this criterion, the criterion of you know, romanticism really exposing some sort of idiosyncrasy. Um, you know, Nietzsche is much more romantic. You know, he's the one who says, well, look at, the look at these barbarians that you condescend to and you think are, you know, merely stupid. You know, look at things through their eyes. And, um, you know, of course there are moments like that in Emerson, but I think they're, uh, they're far less dramatized. And I think the feeling uh, that's given is entirely different. You know, when Emerson, you know, Emerson talks about the effects of something that may have seemed destructive, um, you know, some violent or barbaric force, whereas Nietzsche asks us to look through the eyes of those, of those people. Um, so, you know, to me that makes, that makes part of the point that um, if we're talking about particularity, I mean, basically what Berlin says about romanticism is that it forces us to confront the idea that human beings are irreconcilable in their interests and in their values. Um, and this is something that uh, seems utterly foreign to, uh, you know, to the uh, thinkers of the Enlightenment, the idea that, oh, for some people it is you know, simply, <laughs> you know, it is their happiness or it is their joy to you know, do these awful things. Um, and that that's a fact that we have to somehow recognize and confront as opposed to saying, oh, they're simply misguided and if they knew better they would, you know, feel as we do. So, um, yeah, so it's a coming up against the necessary, I mean, Berlin uses the word pluralism, the necessary pluralism or difference of human experience in that way. Um, but um, in terms of Nietzsche's composing the self, I'll, I'll end my answer in a moment because I'm, I feel like I'm trying to answer several things at once. But um, Nietzsche does want, as, as a number of, think, uh, number of writers on Nietzsche have emphasized, he does want a composed or fashioned self. Um, he uh, he uh, you know, gives a portrait of himself as uh, incredibly sensitive, incredibly sophisticated, incredibly knowing and all of that, and uh, the, the, but part of the, in, for example, in the will to power fragments, part of the, uh, you know, the premise for developing such a self is one's distance from the herd, from distance from, you know, all the sort of schmoes down there who aren't thinking about any of these things. And so, um, 
you know, it's the isolation of the self, I think, that enables Nietzsche's, uh, you know, the sense of himself as being an exception that, uh, that, lets him, uh, that lets him depict himself in this way. And yet Nietzsche is also tempted towards the idea of revealing a new law to humanity or changing humanity in some way in a, in a prophetic sense. So I feel that that seems to be a, a conflict within Nietzsche that can't easily be resolved. That, uh, you know, but I don't know if that answers any. But yes, I think you were first. I'm, I'm interested in this, in this uh, survival of the species yeah. issue. Is this uh, uh, the manifestation of the paranoia uh -huh. that the almighty blow up? Oh, indeed. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what extent is it also related to this idea of progression? Uh huh, uh huh. That uh, evolutionarily, that we're really uh, progressing towards something. You, you talk about the, you know. Uh huh. Well, again, I think this marks the difference that, you know, I never see Emerson saying, you know, the human species might suddenly die out if this happens or that happens, whereas Nietzsche is, you know, is tempted by that thought or he likes to indulge that thought from time to time. And so the very fact that you could think that, that you can think, um, you know, maybe this is the end of everything is, uh, this is the mark of this intense romanticism. Um, I don't know what what's to say beyond that? Does that, is that, is that, is that, that, is that explicitly an evolutionary concept that you oh. find there? I mean, you know, uh, extinction through... Uh, oh, I, I, in terms of his understanding, well, you know, Nietzsche suspected Darwin for various reasons that he thought it was about, you know, too English in the sense that it was merely interested <laughs> in, uh, it was merely interested in establishing survival as some kind of, you know, key overarching motive for, for things. Whereas, in fact, uh, Emerson, uh, in fact, Nietzsche said, life is interested in squandering and wastefulness and so on. But yeah, so in a sense, it's anti-evolutionary because Nietzsche says, well, maybe life will uh, destroy itself. You know, that's a pot instead of whereas evolution suggests that it will go on and on, it will continue in a way that, you know, it's built to survive. And then Nietzsche says, well, perhaps it's built to break down. Um, but yeah, that is the part of the romantic incident that, you know, yes, it could become a collapsed universe that one just doesn't know. Yes. I have, if I may, two questions. Yes. Yes. Okay, well, those are two great questions. The first one, uh, well, I have a certain difficulty or mixed feelings about it. Uh, it's true that uh, Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche, who Nietzsche himself, uh, I mean, who was involved with uh, nationalist and anti-Semitic movements through her husband, movements that Nietzsche himself despised, but she had, a, you know, evidently had a, a, a role in the. Uh, you know, the final state of this manuscript, The Will to Power, but The Will to Power is still Nietzsche's, and it's still, I, I think it's a necessary thing to, um, to study closely when we try to think about Nietzsche. I mean, there's so much that's in it that's, uh, uh, so in other words, it's not, it's not his sister's book, it's his book, although, you know, there may be things that, uh, for all we know, aren't there <laughs> because of her, for example, but, you know, we, we do have the manuscripts of The Will to Power, so. This is, uh, this is his book. Um, well, I mean, there's a longer, more scholarly answer, which I can't give you because I'm not <laughs> you know, a scholar of the will to power in that <laughs> sense. Uh, but uh, in terms of the second answer, uh, the second question that, yeah, I mean, this is what, you know, in, in, uh, in Berlin's passage, he talks about, um, you know, our compulsion to, for example, exterminate people 
And uh, you know, these are very alarming words. Human beings whom we must exterminate are impersonal forces against which all effort is useless. And he's clearly pointing to a way in which uh, romanticism, as he understands it, explains certain aspects of the terrible 20th century in a way that an enlightenment couldn't. And um, yes, it's related to, to other things. I mean, Bataille, of course, was a deep reader of Nietzsche. So the idea that um, you know, uh, the sort of destructive frenzy or ecstasy, which is associated also with the force of life, can take control of, you know, of groups of people. This is, um, you know, it, it's this kind of insight that, that Nietzsche points the way towards. He's not endorsing it, as we know, you know, from the paragraphs that I've given you. He's actually warning against it. Um, he's well aware of, um, of the danger of such phenomena. But um, from the Enlightenment point of view, you wouldn't even recognize the phenomenon, I think. You wouldn't even recognize the possibility of collective madness, for example. Um, um, destructive or genocidal madness. There would be no way to, uh, no, no meaningful way to think about it. Um, I mean, that would be the sort of the pro-Nietzsche approach to the question. Yes? I'm interested <coughs> in the theme of, that came up again and again and you're talking about Nietzsche of, of the dance. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I'm interested in it because uh, in in the presentation today, it, it sounds in his even in his latest works, it sounds like a residue of the Dionysiac. Uh huh. Place yeah. Where the Dionysiac erupts. Uh, so connected then to the Wagner of, of the of the birth of tragedy and so on. And yet, in in the case of Wagner and in some fragments on Mozart and so on from the Will of uh -huh. Power, uh, the dance turns out to be precisely anti-Dionysiac and uh -huh. anti-Wagnerian. It is. Mm -hmm. it is it is exactly what Wagner cannot, Wagnerian music does not do, it does not Right, dance. right, right. How do, you, how do we reconcile these two? Right, yeah, in the, the, the case of Wagner, he talks about Bizet as, uh, you know, this sort of beautiful, this pellucid and perfectly formed, this dancing sort of music, as opposed to Wagner, who is a, you know, of course, uh, entrancing and uh, unavoidable, but somehow crippled, you know, <laughs> example of musician. great image in the, in the case of Wagner is, is, is in, with Wagner, you don't dance, you Right, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so dancing, I mean, I guess to use the opposition, you could say that dancing becomes something Apollonian, in, ideally, in, uh, in Nietzsche, or that uh, when he talks about a figure like Bizet, this is a, this is, you know, it's Dionysian in the sense that it's passionate, but it's Apollonian in the sense that it's perfectly lucid and perfectly controlled as well. And in that respect, it, and it, it's a, a real ideal. But see, I think, you know, my approach to that would be that, you know, even reading the case of Wagner, you sense that I, I'm, I'm one of those people who thinks that Nietzsche is actually very close to Wagner all the way through and that he's making these complaints. But, you know, all the things he says about Wagner are things that you could say about Nietzsche himself. You know, when he says about Wagner, some of the most amazing things and most accurate things ever written about Wagner in the case of Wagner, you know, about how, you know, the importance of the tiny phrase or the tiny moment and then there are these other, but, you know, that applies to Nietzsche's own, Nietzsche's own style and he himself knows his deep affinity to, to Wagner. So I think, you know, that's sort of the instability in Wagner, the sense in which the obsessive nature of Quest, the, the perpetual self-thwarting, you know, the, uh, you know, the falling off into various refuges or various, you know, sort of escapist visions. You know, those are th that's something that Nietzsche, of course, is protesting against because he wants to see himself as a much more, you know, sort of clear, uh, driven thinker, someone who drives to unavoidable conclusions. But, you know, I think that it, it, it uh, you know, but Wagner's universe is the romantic universe as we've been thinking about it. That's you know, as uh, I mean, uh, Berlin mentions Wagner. And I, th I do think that Nietzsche is actually very close to him, that, you know, he can't avoid those. Nietzsche can't avoid those things in Wagner, as he knows. Yes? Uh, there were a couple in the back. Yeah. Oh, Paul, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay.
In the Enlightenment way. <laughs> you mean that in an Enlightenment way? Yeah. Good for this sort of occasion. Very clear. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that there's going to be an answer in the next mm -hmm. response to this dash of behavior. Dash. Uh -huh. And then there's a series of attempts. Mm -hmm. Do you think at all when you're thinking about the difference between them, whether something in language might offer you a different mm -hmm. avenue, mm -hmm. see a big difference? Yeah, so the difference you mean between Nietzsche and Emerson? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the great. Uh, the, 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 the great uh, descriptions of, uh, of Emerson, uh, was it, yeah, it's Henry James Sr., I think, said that uh, seeing Emerson lecture mm -hmm. was like watching a cat picking its way in wet weather. That, you know, he'd say one thing and then you'd see him testing his weight and thinking, okay, then I'll go on to this next sentence. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is an important thing to remember because the, the, those, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, those who attack Emerson th like to think of him as this sort of big, gloppy, you know, rhapsodic swill in which, you know, oh, you just have one, it's, like it's all mixed up together, and then certain great sentences stand out, but it's also a big sort of, you know, um, it, it's all of one piece. And so, um, you know, the, uh, but the, the idea of Emerson, like a cat picking his way in wet weather, he's trying to figure out how to get from one place to another. <laughs> and, you know, you're supposed to think about the gap between one thing that he says and the next thing that he says. And so, um, but that's, it, you know, as I said before in the talk, that it's, um, it's harder to see the way Emerson turns on himself. It's easier to see the way Nietzsche turns on himself. Nietzsche makes it much more dramatic. Because in Emerson, if you don't attend to it carefully, it may seem that you're this is a, just an ever-flowing stream. Um, but uh, in Nietzsche, for example, in the passage that we both talked about from uh, Gay Science, yeah, you have to ask yourself, well, whose side, what, what voice? I mean, one difference, I think, is that in that passage, this is maybe obvious, but Nietzsche is making us wonder, well, what side are you on, Nietzsche? Or what are you, what are you saying in this final sentence, you know? Uh, but old Moses said, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> you know, what is Nietzsche's attitude towards that? Or, you know, he's sort of, he's trying on that proc proclamation, but to what point? It wasn't Moses. It wasn't Moses who said it? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, well, whether it was Moses or someone else who said it, the, um, um, the, the, uh, uh, is, is the point of mentioning that? I mean, one reading would be to say, well, Nietzsche is, like, oh, yeah, well, that's what people will say, but we have to go on destroying what needs to be destroyed. But, you know, I'm going in the other direction, and I'm saying, yeah, but that sentence stands, you know, and it stands as an example of, you know, what Nietzsche would regard as something false, but, you know, something that endures and something that binds people, and that Nietzsche has no answer to it. The paragraph doesn't go on. He can't put anything else up against that statement. So, um, yeah, so Nietzsche, in a very dramatic way, at a moment like that, makes you wonder um, how he's saying something or even who is making that statement. Whereas, um, I mean, I think Emerson is both smoother and in a way more sophisticated in the way he does it. But anyway, I don't know if that helps. You know, there's a bunch of questions now. You were very effective in telling people <laughs> ask questions. OK, you first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the back, yeah. Oh, OK, yes. Oh, but the man in the green shirt asked, uh, well, asked before, yeah.
Yes. And also it's your citation of Mr. saying that he's deaf and always wants to be in the world. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Or I'm saying in general for Nietzsche, as Nietzsche describes it, the exception wants to be the rule. Or what he's most in, the exceptions he's most interested in are those that become the rule, I guess. So, yeah, but go on. So I'm just wondering, in light of those two things, what, what do you think it might mean to describe like, a society or civilization as predominantly romantic rather than... As predominantly romantic. Wow, that's a great question. And... Um, you know, well, you could say that the Romantic era was Romantic civilization, if you want to. Um, and uh, the, um, I, I mean, in a, in a sense, you're asking me for something that I wish I were capable of, but I'm not really capable of, alas, which is, you know, evaluating a society, the degree to which a particular society is um, devoted to or influenced by or invested in, say, Romantic ideals. So that, you know, I can give you a sort of intellectual history answer to the question, but I can't really tell you, you know, does uh, in the year 1820, are there romantic societies, if you see what I mean. Um, so that's, that's one way of thinking about it. And the other way is to say, well, by definition, there's always a mix, right? Um, uh, when I said we are enlightenment people, um, I mean, this is a society that I, I can talk about with more authority, I guess, than any other, because I'm living in it, that, you know, I, I, I don't see much endorsement of, you know, crazy passion here, except as something that, well, it's okay to do that for a few minutes if you keep it under control. So, in other words, it, we live in a pragmatic society, and, and we join pragmatism to the idea of what makes sense and what's to our advantage and what's to the advantage of the species. So, but yeah, those are great questions. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, you. You talk about that contradiction in your conclusion, like the way between, on the one hand, Nietzsche is talking about the brutes and the poets, uh -huh, uh -huh. Being, you know, those things that drive humanity to stay alive. Yes. On the other hand, he warns us in saying that common sense is what preserves us from the impact of these people. Yes. And, you must, and then he says the brutes and the poets must remain the exception. Yes. So what use would these brutes and these poets be precisely if they only remain the exception? I cannot imagine a system of Bingo. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. And when you read through particularly the, the final sections of The Will to Power, it becomes uh, a very pressing problem because, the qu you know, if Nietzsche is simply saying, I want to cultivate my own perfectly idiosyncratic garden up here, far away from everyone else, this seems like a pretty... It seems like a pretty silly line of argument. Clearly, what he wants to be saying is that, no, the exceptions somehow, they have to be influencing everything or they have to be changing everything in some way. Um, they can't, the, the point is not simply distance for the sake of, you know, a sort of hygienic distance so that the exception is, um, is, has a secure life. Um, and then down there you have those who are entrapped by herd morality. Um, I mean, what Nietzsche is, is trying to avoid doing is to say that, uh, uh, oh, I, I want the exceptions to take over. I want them to work over humanity and, uh, you know, convert it utterly to something new. But how can he, but, but what is there between those two alternatives? Yeah. That's not part of his project, like the advent of the overman, for example. Yes. He seems to be like the death of humanity, like humanity yes. preserves itself through common sense. Yes. Maybe Right, right. Well, the way to get out of it would be, I think, a more sort of Cavellian reading where you would say that Nietzsche is speaking to individuals and the indi individuals who listen to him are the exceptional individuals and this is how the message gets distributed. People will either listen or they won't. They think they are exceptional. Well, if they think, think so effectively, then they are, <laughs> you know. So... Right, they're creating... Yeah, yeah, no. And I'm, I'm very... Um, you know, I'm, I'm very moved towards that vision of things, but I, I, I still think that there's a problem that is, um, it, it becomes an increasing sort of thorn in Nietzsche's side, the idea that there is this normative mass, there is this, you know, this herd, this mass of people who are, you know, devoted to the boring, the stolid, the concrete virtues, and, and what to do with this, what, what to say about it. Is it simply something inert that, well, you can just ignore it because what we're really talking about is, are the exceptional ones. You know, that seems to be an unsatisfying conclusion, and I think for Nietzsche it, that is an unsatisfying conclusion. But on the other hand, he's not 
proposing to revolutionize that herd and to say, you, I'm going to impose something new on you. So, um, yeah, you had a question along these lines. Uh-huh. It seems as though Nietzsche's perspective is in this you know, totally eschew no notions of normativity, right? So yeah. the the end of seventy six, where he talks about the fact that the exception can't become the rule, I mean, we're speaking in very abstract terms, right? So mm -hmm. if you were to try to map it onto painting, for instance, mm -hmm. like aesthetics, to say everyone should become Van Gogh destroys the entire sort of beauty mm -hmm. of Van Gogh as a distinct artist, right? Right, so right. You need grand Cousies to challenge Van Gogh and to challenge you know, Sure. Right? Sure. So well, it happens in art. You know, everybody right. starts painting in a certain way. Right. Yeah. I guess the question is, to what extent, like, what question, I guess my, I have two questions, right? What question in the domain of, of life, and maybe it could be life overall, right, but this concern for the herd, to what extent do you think that he thinks that they have freedom to change, or uh -huh. do you think Uh -huh. There's also the, the mind, right? And so if you look at you know, Day Science 341, which is one uh -huh. of the presentations of the eternal return, yes. right? in theory you have a choice to affirm it or not to. Yes, but yes. Then there's this question of, is it your nature, right? I mean, he's describing things, but I, wa I guess I have a question of to what extent does it do this? Or to what extent is it, is it him affirming to himself the whole time uh -huh. in prescriptive terms, right? Is Amor Fati, please God, let me accept the fate of what I am, right? In my uh -huh. I, can't, I can't help but to create you know, velvet motes of these versions of Van Gogh, right? It isn't right. for me to decide who I am in that, but there's more sort of a descriptive aspect. Right. And he's torn asunder by the fact that there's this herd that can't get out of the herd and just run off the cliff. Right, right. right. Well, again, I mean, you could see this, the way I'm tempted to see this is uh, Nietzsche's attempt to revise um, what it means, the understanding of uh, what it means to create new values. What Nietzsche is obsessed by, what he's an incredibly alert diagnostician of, is the way new values get created and imposed on people. So St. Paul, out of nowhere, comes up with a vision of what human life is. People start listening to it, but then it's, it's imposed on an enormous collective mass of people who start thinking this way and believing it. And you're absolutely right. What Nietzsche tries to do is, what Nietzsche proposes is something different. It is more like amor fate. It, it's supposed to be, oh, someone will show you a new version of values, a new take on life, and then you'll be interested in it. You'll choose whether or not to make it yours. Uh, I mean, that, that is what Nietzsche wants, yes. But you know, I think what he's stymied by is the fact that things usually don't happen that way. You, th it happens as a mass phenomenon, as a collective phenomenon. And um, you know, what would it mean to have it happen in this you know, more artistic way, if you, or more individualistic way, if you, if you wanted that? So that's his dream. But, you know, but, but in fact, what, what guides humanity is more often those impositions, you know, those impositions of ideology of uh, views of existence rather than individual choices. So this is something that Nietzsche has a very hard time with. I want to let everybody know that there's a reception right now out here, and I think we give a nice, well, we have a quick, nice round of applause. Thank you.